Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to our live Q&A discussion with NASA and Made in Space regarding 3D printing in space. My name's Adam Mann. I'm the space and physics reporter here at Wired Science in sunny, beautiful California. Um, and we've got uh, a bunch of people here who are ready to take your questions and for this discussion. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, uh, and introduce ourselves, and we'll start over on the left uh, most box with uh, Lenitra. Why don't you tell us your name and, and what you do? Hi, I'm Lenitra Tay, and I work for NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate, and I am one of nine principal investigators for space, space technology responsible for advanced manufacturing. So we are really nice. excited about our 3D um, And we've got uh, a bunch of people here. Sorry about that. And uh, you'll be hearing from Nikki soon and, and Michael Chen from Made in Space about this great effort that we will be launching uh, in the summer of 2014. I'm Lenitra Tate, and I work for NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate. And I am one of nine principal investigators for space technology responsible for advanced manufacturing. So we are really excited about our. Um, and we've got uh, a bunch of people here. <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, you'll be hearing from Nikki soon and, and, and Michael Chen from Made in Space right. about this great effort that we will be launching uh, in the summer of 2014. I'm Alnitra Tate, and I work for NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate. And I am one of nine principal investigators for space, space technology responsible for advanced manufacturing. So we are really excited about our. At least they know who I am. You'll be hearing from Nikki soon and my friends from Made in Space about the great effort that we will be launching in the summer of 2014. I'm Alicia Tate. I work for NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate, and I am one of my have anything open. All right, well, uh, we can land a rover on Mars, but sometimes <laughs> we still have some trouble here with... Uh, um, sorry about that. That was a little screw up on our side. Um, can we uh, keep going? Um, with, with Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to only say it once here. Um, <laughs> okay, we, we good? Everything sounds good? Mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Chen. I am one of the co-founders of Made in Space. I um, helped to found the company in 2010, and uh, we're, the, we're basically making the first 3D printer that will be going to space and manufacturing the first objects off of the surface of the Earth later this year. Cool. And Nikki? Hi there. I'm, I'm Nikki Workheiser. I'm the NASA project manager for the 3D printing and zero-g ISS technology demonstration. As Lenny mentioned, it'll be launching on SpaceX 4 in August of 2014, and we're very excited. This will be the first 3D printer ever uh, launched into space, so uh, it, it's very exciting. Glad to be here. Excellent. Um, and just a reminder for anybody who's watching, you can uh, go to our Google Plus page. There should be a link below uh, this screen and, and ask us any questions during the Q&A. We'll try and field as many of them as we can from that and from Twitter. Um, but maybe to start off with, just to get the ball rolling here, um, 3D printers are, are really cool. They're um, great, fantastic new technology. Uh, but maybe, Mike, you want to start us off and tell us why would we would want to send one into space? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and um, we could really even talk about it for the whole time here. But as to why, why send a 3D printer to space, um, you know, really, like, originally, uh, a few years ago when the company started, the idea actually arose from talking to Dan Barry, who's a three-time astronaut. And you know, he's been up there a few times and um, playing with 3D printers down here and really just observing how 
useful it would be to be able to have objects put into space without actually having to launch them. And so at the end of the day, that's really what it boils down to, is it boils down to being able to actually put objects in space without having to deal with the slow, expensive, complex, risky business of rockets. What if you could just put a file directly on the computer and print it in space minutes later? So would it be something that you would use um, maybe like in an emergency situation or if there was something that was going wrong up on the space station? You absolutely would. Um, you know, one thing that we, we've looked at a lot is how we would be able to be ready for situations like that. You know, our, one of our favorite examples is, of course, the Apollo 13 example, where they had to basically fit a square peg into a round hole in order to save the astronauts' lives. And they were able to rig together a solution just kind of based on what they had up there at the time, which was very fortunate. Um, we actually had one of our interns use uh, Autodesk software to CAD up a solution that would have also worked in the Apollo 13 situation, printed it on one of the printers in our lab, and did the whole thing in, a, in just a matter of hours. Uh, now he's hired, obviously. Um, but yeah, it could definitely be used for emergency situations, but there's really a, a whole wide range of, of other things you could use it for, science experiments, uh, aiding uh, space exploration, commercial satellite projects, there's really, the list just goes on and on. I'm wondering, um, for any of you actually, how did this, how did this partnership uh, get started? Who, who reached out to who? Whose idea was it to, to put uh, a 3D printer in space? Um, yeah, Nikki uh, might want to talk a little bit about that. You know, there's been some work going on at Marshall for a while now, uh, since actually even before we began developing this printer. Uh, Marshall's really been ahead of the game on that, and so that's why we're working with Marshall, but maybe Nikki wants to talk a little bit about, about that one. Yes, I'd be happy to. So actually in 1999, uh, one of our, our principal investigator here, Ken Cooper, actually flew a 3D printer on the, the parabolic flights, affectionately known as the Vomit Comet, um, to test that out back then. So for us, this feels like it's been a long time coming. Um, as, as you know, uh, Space Station has been, has been built for, for quite some time, and, and uh, we've been excited about getting this up as an actual payload. Um, Made in Space and NASA have flown a series of the parabolic flights to test in the microgravity just to make sure that the prints would actually be equitable to earth quality prints like we do on the ground. But you can only get the short spurts of microgravity when you're on the parabolic flight. So this will be the first time in space that we can actually complete an entire print um, in microgravity. So that's why we call it a technology demonstration as a very first step to ensure that in the microgravity environment uh, the process is the same, there are no surprises um, that, that would change the, the quality of the print. Um, and we feel quite confident that that will be uh, it will be equitable to what we do on the ground based on the parabolic flights. But yes, we've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, we feel like there are many, many uses. Of course, the emergency case comes up a lot, and that's kind of the exciting case. But there's also the standard every day, and people laugh because they the the crew will talk sometimes about the losing a tool on space station, and we get a lot of comments like. How could you lose something? It's the space station. Where could it possibly go? But if you're like me, I've lived in my house for a few years. My closet, if you go in my closet, you'll see how you can easily lose things in a contained environment. Um, small parts especially tend to float off and get sucked in by the filters. You can imagine at home, if I drop something, it falls to the floor. I know where to look for it. Um, if it floats off uh, on space station, then it does get sucked into these filters, never to be seen again. So there's a lot of lost parts, broken parts that they have to fly multiple spares for that take up a lot of mass. Um, so there are a lot of even everyday type uh, activities with science and payloads and crew tools, um, things like that, that this will be a great capability for. And if I can add, um, the 3D print project is a, it's a great example of collaboration between NASA mission directorates as well as industry. Um, this is a collaboration between a Space Tech Mission Directorate as well as our Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, which houses our ISS and our AES programs, which are also investing in this. And uh, Made in Space um, did initial work uh, with our Flight Opportunities Program, but they also have a recent contract under our SBIR program. So it's a really great example of how NASA comes together with industry and does something really great, both on the technology side and the operations side. Cool. Um, and Nikki, is that a is that a 3D printed part you've got in your hand there? 
Yeah, so I wanted to kind of kind of show a part here that it may not look super exciting. Um, it, people say, well, what can you print? What can you do? And, and something like this, uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it doesn't look that exciting in person, but it is. Um, this, for example, is a part that was a, a filter extraction tool for a facility that we have on Space Station. And a couple of years ago, uh, it got lost on Space Station, and the filters had expired, the certification for using that facility. And the crew could not use that facility. So several of our science payloads, I think it was six or eight months, they had to wait for the, the next launch to launch up this little filter extraction tool. We literally could have uplinked this file to Space Station um, and had it printed within, say, an hour turnaround. And you can imagine the, the number of hours and, and days that, that we were down in that facility, the science that we didn't get to do um, for lack of having this kind of capability. So I just wanted to show this as just kind of some, some fun parts, um, real life, real use uh, parts that we can get um, up there quite quickly. And, and another reason we think that the, the astronauts are pretty excited. Yeah, like you said, it, I guess it, some of it is kind of mundane, but um, still really necessary. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, some questions here from our audience. The first one is from Hernando Sanchez Fadiev, and I guess this is something that probably everybody is wondering. Uh, maybe, Mike, you can talk about this. How does not having gravity um, affect 3D printing, actually? Like, does it make it easier, harder? What are, what are the challenges? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a, a common question, and I'll, I'll try to say as much of it as I can without saying certain things that we, we aren't actually allowed to speak about. But, um, I mean, really, when we, when we first started the company, the idea was um, actually not to create our own 3D printer. We really, we saw the benefit of having a 3D printer in space. If there's a lot of people watching now who are familiar with, like, the concept of Shapeways or these service-based 3D printing businesses, we just really thought, wow, it would really help further space exploration if we had a 3D printer in space. And so we started getting as many sort of already available 3D printers that we could get commercial off the shelf and flying them on those vomit comets and parabolic flights that Nikki was talking about. And, you know, be between our engineers, there was a lot of debate in the beginning. It was like, well, some people thought they wouldn't require too much tweaking. Some people thought that they would. But we actually found out that um, none of them worked, right? And what, what you really find out, you know, at the end of the day is there's, you know, somewhere around, like, 15 to 20 little things that you, you have to change um, in order to make 3D printing work in space. And some of the easy ones to sort of visualize um, would be, you know, the, the precision of the control that you would need is, is a great example. Um, you know, these, these pieces, these parts are very highly precise uh, when, when they need to be manufactured. And if, if something's off by even a little bit, it can be weak inside. And without having the force of gravity to kind of hold things in place, it's actually, um, it can be really surprising uh, how bad things can really get. You know, that's just, just one of the things. And in addition to... Um, the gravity, there's a whole bunch of other things you have to solve as well. There's safety issues, uh, you know, commercial off-the-shelf 3D printers emit harmful, toxic gases that you can't have up there. So we ended up learning uh, over the years through really um, part luck and, and part just our amazing engineering team that there's all these changes that we had to make, everything from the gravity to the safety to the off-gassing. And um, we ended up having to develop our own uh, 3D printer from ground up to work in space. Now we joke that if we knew that we had to do that, we probably might not have even started because it was a lot harder than we thought. But uh, we're really excited to be putting it up there. So. Cool. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, or Lenitra, maybe you could talk to this about what, what exactly the astronauts would potentially be printing in space. Like we, we saw Nikki's thing, it looked like it was made out of plastic. Is that sort of what you're thinking you would be printing in space? And uh, how often would you want to use it? Is this sort of like an everyday thing you'd, you'd hope the astronauts are using? So Nikki and I are all tag team. Um, okay. We received a, a list of uh, usual tools and parts that the astronauts would use or they may need resupply. And I think we received a list of 13. And so out of those 13, we'll do a total of 21 prints uh, that will be uploaded on the printer prior to launch. Um, and then I'll let Nikki talk a little bit about the exact uh, tools and parts that we'll print and the material that we'll use. 
Yeah, Lenitra. So um, actually, yeah, we'll do our first series of prints. Will be that 21, and we'll start with some some kind of things that might look kind of boring or mundane. You know, our tinsel specimens and and uh, strain uh, specimens, so we can test those on the ground. Then we'll move on to what Lenitra referred to, the the crew tools. We've been working closely with the the IVA, the intravehicular. Um, tools office down at Johnson Space Center that supports the astronauts to get a list of things that were kind of the the no-brainers where would you start um, I did want to point out uh, if you can see this when we first start this is the feedstock so it looks very similar to what um, you would see like on your weed eater we joke a lot about your weed eater spool that's how it starts um, there are really two or three categories of things that you can print first of all we're thinking about the most common things that we have to launch right and it cost a lot to launch things into space and we have to fly these spares for the parts they really need. Multiple wrenches, um, uh, all kinds of uh, sample containers and, and little uh, clips and type things. It don't look super exciting but when you have to pack you know 10 or 12 spares at least of each of these items your mass adds up quickly. But there's a whole other uh, category that you have to think about as well and that is a lot of things that we design to fly in space um, you really have to design those around the launch loads so the structure that you build, it has to be um, quite robust to survive actual loads of launch. If you can actually design these parts in space, this is where I get really excited, um, it, it's really a whole mentality shift. Um, you can design completely differently. Uh, so even things like, um, I don't know if you've heard much about the CubeSats, the NanoSats that are being launched. Um, they've launched uh, quite a few from Space Station now. Um, and with nanotechnology, you can fit a lot in those uh, in those little suckers. So you can do science, and you can do communications. You can do a, a plethora of things with these CubeSats. Um, if you could actually print the structure in space um, instead of launching that and have to design it to meet the launch loads, um, you think how much space that that actually uh, opens up for you. So there are things, all sorts of things. We're just now really starting, and we and we need innovative ideas. Um, NASA is is making calls and creating challenges. Um, to get innovative ideas for how would you design something differently in space. I don't have my little wrench here with me right now, but for example, you know, I go to Home Depot and I buy a wrench, and, and everybody has a, a, an image of a metal wrench that I get from Home Depot. But if I could design that for, for the application on Space Station or on the Moon or Mars, I might could design it differently um, on a 3D printer. It might look flatter. It might look, um, I, I joke, it might look kind of like the, the tools that my kids played with when they were real little toddlers, the little tool sets with the hammers and the wrenches. It may be flatter um, and in a different shape, but it might work just fine for what we need. And this is really important on Space Station. We've extended the life of Space Station, and we have a lot of things that are running out of certification um, and, and things that we need to, uh, to fly up. But it's absolutely, and I can't stress this enough, it's a critical technology and capability. If we're going to go to Moon or Mars or an asteroid, and we're really going to explore um, our solar system, this is something we cannot be reliant on uh, things launched from the ground every time we need a new tool. And we need our astronauts to be able to design what they need. Um, kind of like a, a MacGyver on the go. So uh, so there, there's I, multiple. And I'd add to that, um, we like to think of it as on-demand living. So if you think about, the, we may not can think about what the astronauts may need at a particular moment, but having the capability to be able to print what they need and as well be able to design what they need changes the whole logistical game of uh, space exploration. Um, and just to add, piggyback on what Nikki said, this printer is a FDM, modified FDM, so that means we'll be printing plastic um, initially. Um, and then we'll also um, fly up an optical scanner uh, eventually that will allow us to inspect the part after we print it. Cool. Um, are all those pieces that you're showing us, Nikki, those are all 3D printed, and are those all things that are going to be, or like things that, that the printer that's going up on the space station could do? Absolutely. Um, yes, and, and I always make the joke we talk about the ABS plastic, but it's what your Legos are made out of, so that's the, the common uh, common terminology I like to throw out. But, but yes, you know, we've got sample containers, you know, uh, we can print multiple, you know, parts that fit together. I've got a lot more fun parts uh, back in the lab that I could show, but I don't have them all with me. Um, little clips and you know, things like uh, little fitted parts, and you can also get very creative. You can actually build things, um, you know, your print volume, but then you stack those things so they can connect in certain ways. Um, so you can actually build larger structures by connecting them. So um, we're trying to think of a lot of fun um, and useful things that we can print. Yeah, cool. and I just want to jump in and add to that. I think there's some really good points made there. Um, I think what, what we're most excited about here on the Maiden Space side, in addition to that, 
is that, you know, as kind of mentioned, this is the first printer we're sending up is, is a technology demonstration. Um, but really based on the technology that we've built here, there's going to be a second printer going up after that, which is going to be a commercial facility where we're going to actually be opening it up so that anyone in the world really can print things in space. And that really speaks to, I think, uh, something that Lenitra was touching on earlier about how great of a partnership this is between uh, NASA and private industry. You know, we've been able to build this technology working with NASA. But now, you know, we have um, a lot of people contacting us who are saying, you know, we'd like to put something in space. We want to put something on a space station. You know, when, when can you print for us, right? And I think it's, this is really, really important for furthering space exploration. You know, if you look at how uh, amazing the potential is for space exploration, you know, not only could it hold the, you know, the future of the human race, literally, but it's also already the backbone of so many of the essential pieces of what we do here on Earth today, GPS, cell phones, satellites, all of this. Space is so important, but really, up until now, it's been very, very difficult to access. Really, only governments and powers with billions of dollars could even ever put something there. And so one of the things I'm most excited about is once we have this printer there, we're going to be opening up access to space to a whole new class of people, organizations, and individuals, and teams on Earth. Literally, um, and I really mean this for anyone who, who's tuned in right now, if there is something that you, you do want to put in space, um, this really, we, we really want to make it possible so that everybody has a chance to go ahead and do that. You might actually have the idea right now for a better way that an astronaut could do something up there. You might have a better idea for how various things could be done. And we want to make it so that that global collaboration that we're seeing with app development and all of these other areas that you know some 15-year-old in Europe somewhere comes up with an idea and it suddenly it is able to get to the top of the app store. Why can't that same kid be developing solutions for space? And when the, the 3D printer is there, I, I really think that speaking of what we're going to print that's going to be most exciting, I think it's going to be the things that we haven't even thought of yet that when people on Earth really wake up and realize that, wow, now they actually can put things into space in an affordable and fast way, um, that's when the innovation is really going to take off and we're going to get the developments we need to further space exploration. And Mike, it's as simple as a student um, getting access to a CAD file and uplinking it directly to the printer and printing something in zero-G on the space station. I, I think that that's very powerful. powerful. But and I'd like to add to that too. We'll have we'll have some of the files um, that we're going to be printing in space available here on the ground. Um, it, there's an open.gov initiative to have open source information. So anyone on the ground, say um, my daughters were excited about this when they were doing science fair. They were saying, "So mommy, if I have access to a 3D printer, I can print the exact thing on on the ground and show my friends that the astronauts are going to print in space." And that's absolutely true. I'd also like to add, um, NASA is really trying to clear the path for this commercialization effort. Um, our end goal is that eventually, once all this happens and, and Made in Space uh, has the commercial printer on orbit, that NASA is actually a customer of that printer. Um, we have the ISS is a national lab, and I, I encourage folks to, to to Google that and see the cool things that we're doing with our space station. Um, it, a lot of people know that it's up there, and they know we're doing probably some really cool stuff. Um, but but this commercialization, and, and it's really a national asset that we want to utilize um, effectively and efficiently. So ultimately, we want to be a customer of this as well. NASA isn't looking to be the one to build the printers, but to enable the path and to, and to utilize the printers. Cool. Um, we actually have a, a different another different question over here from uh, Destry Peter. Um, and uh, I think some of the things that you guys are talking about, uh, people might be excited. Um, will there be a chance of live streaming or, or tweeting from the 3D printer in space? Like, are people going to be able to see stuff come out of the uh, <laughs> out of the printer somewhere on NASA TV? We actually will be recording um, the prints. Uh, we'll be getting a lot of science data from that. But we actually are planning to have an, a, a twit the printer itself to have a Twitter account. And um, so the, the, we're hoping the printer itself will be tweeting and, and receiving tweets, and uh, we can kind of see where it goes from there. Uh, we do have some educational outreach, um, some STEM activities uh, that we'd like to work with schools um, and other outlets, and some cool challenges that everybody needs to kind of be listening out for um, that, that will be announced uh, in the near future. So we're really excited about that. But yes, we do plan for the printer to have a Twitter and I'm sure a Facebook account as well. So. Uh, it'll be interactive, and we will be having videos of the actual printing while they're taking place. Cool. Very cool. 
Um, I have uh, another another question here from Travis Nelson Hummel, um, and maybe this is also something I'm wondering. It, how, uh, and we can talk sort of about how uh, how things are moving in the future, but um, how far-fetched is the idea of sending a 3D printer to an asteroid, to the moon, or to Mars, and having it build a space station or uh, you know tools, some some base for the astronauts to live to live in? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I'm sure we'll all have something to say there. Um, I guess the the biggest thing that I wanted to say in response is that really that's why we're doing all of this. You know, the uh, when we um, started looking at how to put 3D printers in space, we were very excited about the prospects of really changing the way that things were done on the space station. But as a company, we we really are focused on enabling those. Uh, bigger space exploration goals, kind of like we mentioned, um, you know, going to asteroids, moon, Mars, building entire space stations, things like that. And uh, so we, we focused the entire time on developing technology that would be possible to use inside the space station, but also have major applications in all of those other areas. So um, we view this as a very real and important step towards those further out goals. That's kind of what's amazing about 3D printing as a technology is it's so versatile. The same thing that can print a little wrench like this um, may also be able to print a lot of other uh, much more complicated and, and larger and more progressive things. So uh, that, that's absolutely the focus. And this sort of step of manufacturing the first thing in space uh, at all and then you know, the next 10, 20, 30, and however many after that on station uh, is, is a very important milestone on the way to those future steps, both technologically and just societally. So NASA as a whole, we've looked at a, an entire roadmap of uh, the future of manufacturing in space. And we look at it from a point of view of building the capability so that we can explore deeper and deeper space. So we look at the International Space Station, we look at uh, ground base, and we look at other planetary services that include the asteroid as different testing and proving grounds and platforms that first we start with the 3D printer on zero G, then, you know, as a plastic, then maybe we look at metals, and then we look at a recycler, and then we go external to the space station, and we look at how do we use what we've learned from the 3D printer, and now start using that to build larger structures or being able to function on other planetary surfaces, and then using those resources or in situ resources from another planetary surface to... Uh, afford us an infrastructure that we can explore um, in other parts of the universe. So, so if I could add to that just a little, because this is a very exciting area. Um, so the term that's kind of being coined is in-space manufacturing. And like Lenitra and Mike both referred to, it's, it's really a whole suite of capabilities. And the 3D printer inside Space Station is just a very, very first step. Um, as Lenitra mentioned, uh, we have things like external. Imagine if we had um, a micrometeor, everybody's probably seen the movie Gravity. Imagine if you had a micrometeorite hit on station. Currently, we don't have a really a way to do an in-space repair. Um, but imagine if we could structure light scan. They have handheld scanners, which Lenitra referred to earlier that uh, we plan to fly soon. You could actually scan um, the hit, and then you could reverse engineer a CAD model out of that and then print a patch. Um, in addition to that, I don't know if you've heard much about the contour crafting or the additive construction. Um, if you Google that today, you'll see some articles pop up. Um, where in China, for example, they've been building temporary housing. You, that's a capability that's not science fiction. That's a capability that exists today on the ground. Um, it's, it's a very exciting one. Um, you can imagine in a case like a natural disaster with FEMA or um, our, our military out in a remote area, if you could build things like landing pads and, and remote shelters, um, you can imagine on Mars, or uh, if you needed a radiation uh, protection habitat. And as Lenitra mentioned, uh, for, for our space exploration, you would use the in situ. So you would use the, the regolith from whatever um, um, terrestrial being you might be on. But on the ground, maybe you could use sand. So there's a lot of cool technologies um, that are on the ground that Na NASA and, and companies like Maiden Space um, can leverage. There are things we have to tweak and do a little differently for the in-space applications, um, but we are uh, keeping up with the current technologies and, and leveraging those where we can. Um, there's also things like recycling. Uh, we, we hope to find station uh, today, as a matter of fact, um, I think there might be an announcement for the 
2014 Phase 1 uh, Small Business Innovation uh, Awards, and uh, we had put one out for recyclers. We think the next key step would be to show that you could turn this part back into the, the feedstock and then reuse that feedstock for exploration. You can imagine how key that would be. Um, that's also something we could use on the ground for if we have printers in our home, which I think a lot of us will shortly. Um, so uh, we're excited about looking into that type of uh, demonstration as well. Yeah, and I just, I just want to throw one other thing on the end there, which is tying back to what I said before of just really reminding people that with these 3D printers on the space station, uh, you are going to be able to design things and impact space exploration, right? So even if we're doing something small on the space station, there are experiments that you can do there that are very relevant to, say, printing something on an asteroid, right? So if you're interested in the idea of what could you do on an asteroid, um, we can prove a lot of those ideas and test a lot of those ideas with what we're doing on station now. And um, again, being able to have that like more global open access to ideas Right. Maybe now a high school team can think of an experiment that uh, is simulating something about an asteroid. We 3D print it and we do it. it. Just having that so much more open to the world is really going to accelerate our progress towards being able to do it, say, with an actual asteroid. And I would add that um, you know we're setting up a, a 3D printer, a box, but printing on another planetary surface would look totally different. Um, it would be a, a very automated, very robotic. Uh, with a print head of some sort. So to stretch your imagination of what, what that would look like, and you have to start from somewhere to establish that capability, and I think the 3D print um, effort really uh, triggers that thought process to allow us to, to think what would that look like? What would being able to use additive manufacturing or some other form of in-space manufacturing to, to uh, create infrastructure on other planetary surfaces. It looked totally different than what we could imagine. That's and you think cool. about an integrated system, too, for like printable electronics, yeah. really hot area. So the integrated system would have all of these capabilities where you could verify the part meets specifications, and you have printable electronics and the autonomy and the software. Um, so it's, it's very exciting, and we really hope to hear back from people out there in, in, in in universities and schools and in the general public because this is a, a very innovative area and one that we feel strongly we can interact with the public in. Um, it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's somewhat of a mentality shift and uh, we, we look forward to hearing from, from folks across the country. Cool. Um, yeah, I guess I, would, I was going to ask you if you could maybe describe to us what, what this would actually look like um, when, let's say, it's developed. Obviously this is you know science fiction far out there, but if you wanted to build a house, would you have to drop a house-sized printer down down there on the moon, let's say? Well, those are things that we're, we're looking at today. Lanitra can talk, too. But like I said, the technology on the ground exists today. Um, it's one that's evolving quickly because I think there's a, a real-world need for that. Um, and the answer is really no. Um, there's some really cool technologies out there now where um, it doesn't have to be the size of a house to print a house. You can actually print uh, piece by piece and build on those structures um, autonomously with, with robots. Um, there's, there's all kinds of, and that's where I was really bringing up the innovative ideas. Um, it, it's, it doesn't have to be one plus one equals two. Um, you can actually take advantage of integrated systems and robotics and autonomy. Um, to actually uh, come up with, with new and different ways of doing this in a smaller package. Cool. Um, actually, Nikki, I'm also just wondering, uh, you, you mentioned, and, and maybe Mike can talk about this as well, that you guys have had tests on the, on the Vomit Comet. Um, and <laughs> can, you, uh, can you describe that a little bit more? I'm also just wondering, like, you've got 30 seconds, this thing is printing, it's in the middle of something, and, oh, your 30 seconds are up, do you have to grab the machine before it's going to crash into the floor? Um, yeah, so it's uh, no, it, it is bolted down, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it, it, it's it flies in a parabola, so what you get is you get yeah about you know 30 seconds or so of zero g, and then it pulls into two g, and uh, that the two g is actually the part that most people's stomachs have a problem with. But no, what we actually did was to actually make it easier on ourselves. Um, we started making the printer so that it would actually be able to print all the way throughout the entire uh, parabola, so anywhere from zero to two, or actually anywhere. So uh, it's something we don't actually talk about that much, but since you brought it up, um, 
I mean, yeah, what we actually have developed is not just a zero-gravity printing technology, but a gravity-independent printing technology. So we actually just let it print all the way through, and in our final iterations, you, you look at the final prints, and you couldn't even tell. It's like whether it was zero or two or anywhere in between, the part would be uh, indistinguishable. So, Ooh. yeah. Um, do you guys know what the, the very first thing you're going to print on the space station is when it gets up there in August? So we, we are playing around with um, you know, a, a few different concepts. There is one that's kind of uh, on our minds right now. Um, but I guess, Nikki, are we, are we talking about that publicly at this point? Or? Well, well, as I mentioned earlier, I should have brought some with me, but the, the very first parts um, look kind of mundane and, 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 and trivial to the common layman eye because they are things like tinsel specimens. Uh, the, the key objective here is to get those samples. Uh, we'll learn a lot with the camera recording the print and how the layers are being laid in real time, um, but then we'll also be bringing those back to the ground and doing detailed ground analysis. So that's kind of the, the science-y. Um, we get excited about it. Not everyone thinks it's that exciting. Um, but then after that, we do have uh, several tools. One thing I'll mention is like replacement parts for the printer. Um, there, there are certain components of the printer itself um, and I'll let Mike, if he wants to talk about that a little bit more, that if we need to replace those, um, just normal wear and tear, just like your, the printer on, on the ground, we want to be able to pr print some of those replacement parts, um, be our first kind of customer and user. Uh, and Mike, if you want to talk more about that, feel free. Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, we, we designed the printer itself to have a number of components inside that are actually 3D printed, right? We sort of wanted to um, prove that, you know, really you could you could have real space hardware with 3D printed parts. I mean, it's something that we know, um, but it's not, you know, it's not quite clear to everyone. So we, we took every opportunity to make uh, quite a number of really important parts inside our 3D printer actually 3D printable. And the printer itself is actually going to be able to print uh, its own replacement parts to a certain extent. And some of the first things we're going to be printing are going to be uh, those actual replacement parts. And uh, if all goes as planned, we're actually going to maybe even try to install them back in the printer and just show that it was actually able to repair itself. Cool. Um, I'm going to take one, one last question here from our audience. This one is from Jared Phipps, um, who asks if, if there are any new technologies that we believe we could see in zero-G only that are completely different than, uh, than what we would have here on Earth with 3D printing. Sure. Um, yeah, I think Nikki was about to, to go. I, I'll, I'll say, and then we'll let We're all excited say. about it. Yeah. So, so is, the answer is okay. there, there absolutely could be. Yeah, we do get excited about that. Um, the, the answer is there absolutely could be. Um, one of the reasons we do call this a technology demonstration is, is just what we were saying. They can fly the parabolic flights, but we can't complete an entire print during that microgravity burst on a parabolic flight. So truly what, what's really exciting for us kind of geeky folks on, on the material side of this as well is, is we don't know for sure what in microgravity might happen. We might actually see some improvements. Um, the way the printer is designed, you know, we don't have convection in space, for example. Um, so there, back when we were doing a lot of crystal growth, we saw a lot of improvements in the way the crystal structure um, uh, was 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 built, um, so we can actually possibly see that as well. We just don't know, and that that is the exciting part about a technology demonstration. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just uh, the, the microgravity aspect of might we see something different. It's how we can design differently. Um, we we might. I think I, I'm positive that we are going to come up with, and you, the public, help us come up with new and innovative ways of making stuff in space that we've never been able to do just because of the way we have to launch it. Um, so the answer is yes, we absolutely could find some cool uh, materials aspects of this that make it uh, different than printing on the ground, but it's an absolute 100% certainty that we will find new things to print and use um, in a different way um, in the microgravity environment. But yeah. I would just add, just from, I'm sorry, Mike, um, sure. um, just from the, the mere redesign, Made in Space did several parabolic flights, and they've had to come up with their own design. Just starting from that point, We've we've added to the to the knowledge base of 3D printing from print heads to uh, you know how you know how's the polymer going to flow out. So I think you know credit is is due to Made in Space for just taking that risk and being innovative to design their own printer. Uh, well, thanks, Lenny Truman. Kind of like I said earlier, we actually didn't even set out to do it, and it was a very interesting road, but. 
Yeah, it's been, it's, it, it, you are right. You know, now we actually have developed a number of technologies for 3D printing that are, I think, going to be really useful you know, in space, but also down here on Earth. Um, I know we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to reiterate kind of Nikki's last point because I think it's the most solid takeaway to that question of what is different about what you can print in space and how 3D printing works. I mean, if you've ever designed anything to be 3D printed, um, you're doing engineering, you've definitely thought about the fact that there's going to be gravity, right? So you're going to have to design the part to support its own weight. Uh, even worse, if it has to be launched, it has to support much more than its own weight, also the vibrations and everything like that. Um, just close your eyes one time and imagine what it would be like to design something that had that didn't ever have to support any weight at all. And you end up with these completely different kinds of structures that uh, really could be incredibly beneficial in a lot of ways. And 3D printing in space is most likely the only way to make those structures. So. So, so y'all help us, uh, help us coin a term. Well, you know, we've been throwing around terms like zero-G structures, but we're really uh, trying to, to create a term that is something that you can print with microgravity that you couldn't do on Earth. So I joke around with the guys at Main Space and I say, okay, well, how would we print our ground samples? How do we know it works? And, and, and the, the point is, um, you know it doesn't work on the ground, and that's why you're doing it in space for the zero-G type structures. Um, and, and we've been playing around with what some of those might be, and it's a, a really fun dialogue to have. So I encourage y'all, um, I think we'll have some of our contact information um, out there, and feel free to contact us with, with fun, cool ideas on, uh, or, or different ways of, of explaining zero-G structures. Um, and I, I know we're about to wrap up, but I just wanted to, NASA does so many things, er, everyone looks at NASA as being the cool agency, but we do so many things to advance technology, both for space exploration as well as for daily life. And 3D printing, uh, as we all know, it's been around for 20, 25 years, and there's a new resurgence of 3D printing. And this weekend, NASA um, had a booth at the USA Science and Engineering Festival, and Space Tech had a 3D printer. And there were so many young kids that came to explore the 3D printer. And I think this is an opportunity with our 3D printing and Zero-G to really impact the next generation of science and engineers. And so I think if, if setting aside the technology that we're going to develop, I think we're making a, a real big impact on our younger generation. And I think 3D printing is that technology that really will, will help influence that. Awesome. Um, we are pretty much almost out of time here. Uh, I just wanted to maybe ask you guys one last simple question. Uh, if you, <laughs> I don't know if, if uh, any of you have an answer to this, but how much were you inspired by replicators uh, on Star Trek with this technology? Um, well, I can say a hundred percent. You know, I definitely grew up watching all that stuff, and. Um, we actually had Rod Roddenberry stop by our office not too long ago, who's the son of Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, and uh, we uh, had the amazing moment where he actually came into our, our lab and put his hand on our printer and actually said, T Earl Grey hot. So that was a pretty cool moment for all the Star Trek fans out there. Of course, it didn't make the T yet, but that'll be for a future, future version of the printer. Um, but yes, absolutely inspired. So. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, Melinda, sure, Nikki. Absolutely. Hey, I think uh, I think uh, it's obvious. We hear that a lot, and, and this definitely is uh, along the, the lines of the replicator. We're trying to make that real. I also think those Big Bang guys might like this as well. <laughs> definitely. I'm a diehard Trekkie, and so uh, when I think of this, I think of um, the next the, the next step of actually um, tr trans transporting ourselves to a planetary surface. This is just a starting point. So I think we really get very excited about this, and I hope that you see that when we talk about 3D printing, because we think it's the best thing since um, chocolate milk. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us, for sitting through some of our technical difficulties, some construction here at Wired's offices as well. Um, if you want to find out more information, we've got information about uh, both this NASA effort and Made in Space on our Google Plus page. Um, and you can try and contact any of the folks that you've talked to today. So thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank we look forward to hearing back. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.